Welcome to the Parenting Then and Now podcast, the show that remembers the good and sometimes the not so good old days of parenting past. I'm your host, Samantha Kemp Jackson from the Multiple Mayhem Mama blog, and every week we'll be talking about how things were then and how they are now. Parenting through the lens of the ages, if you will. Now, whether you're a parent, a kid, or someone who used to be a kid, you'll want to stay tuned as we reminisce about the past, embrace the future, and marvel in the present how things have changed. If you're ready to glance back in time at kids, parenting, and the good old days, you're in the right place. So sit back, relax, and let's take a trip down parenting's memory lane. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Google the term World's Worst Mom and Lenore Skenazy's name will come up. For many of us, it would be a dubious distinction at best, for most of us, a nightmare at worst. After all, we want to feel that we're good at what we do, that we mother our kids well, and, well, we keep our kids safe. After all, isn't that what moms are supposed to do? After allowing her nine-year-old son to ride the New York subway alone, Lenore was chastised in print and media, being called irresponsible, dangerous, and a choice of other unflattering terms. Lenore was vilified by the perfect parents who apparently always did everything right. Moreover, parental pundits, as I call them, you know, the ones who seem to have all the answers, had much to say about Lenore's apparent failure at providing the necessary care and obligatory hovering over her son. An advocate of free-range parenting and a leader in the movement in getting back to basics with our kids, Lenore is someone I think we can all listen to. Listeners of this podcast know that it's all about the way things used to be compared to today, and there was a time when kids were allowed to do so much more than they are today. Their parents gave them responsibility and independence, and guess what? They survived. Today, we're living in a world where helicopter parenting is the norm and our children are watched and followed by their parents more often than not. Is this a good thing? Does it really help our children to follow them to the degree that we do these days? Let's hear what Free Range Parenting's most staunch supporter has to say about all of this. Here's our interview. Welcome to the Parenting Then and Now podcast, Lenore. Thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you. And thank you for even thinking about time as a great way to get perspective on on, on our own era. I mean, I don't think, I think you're the only one who thinks about this stuff. Well, I'm clearly not the only one because you've been thinking about it for some time, I, I see. Yeah, actually, in my, you know, so I wrote the book Free Range Kids and in it, there's a chapter that says, I can't remember the title of it, um, because that was then, and this is now. Yeah. It's about nine years later. But there was a chapter called, you know, look at history. And, you know, almost any other era in human history, uh, people would have dreamed of the kind of safety for their children that we have today. You know, no more diphtheria, no more polio, a steady source of, you know, safe and secure food that isn't overrun by, you know, bull weevils and rats. This sounds too great. Sign me up. And then, okay, you're signed up. It's 2017. And that's like, oh, wait, I don't want him to go around the corner. Anything could happen. And it's just, if there was a way to install a little chip that just played what, what, you know, your child's life would be like 100 years ago or 200 years ago versus now, I think I think we wouldn't have any helicopter parenting and I think be done with a bunch of the laws that we have too. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, uh, you know, you have such an interesting story and how you kind of came to the forefront from a media perspective to me is fascinating um, just because, you know, I look at it sociologically as a parent, mm-hmm. as an advocate of free range parenting and, mm-hmm. and you know, I'm, I'm kind of you know, a little bit um, hesitant, or not hesitant, I'm I, I'm against helicopter parenting. I am. And I'll tell you why. And I will, at the same time, talking out of two sides of my mouth, I will say right. that I, I have that been... We all have helicopter <laughs> elements, yes. I definitely have them. I'm, I'm <laughs> guilty of being part of this whole, you know, recent societal systemic... Um, 
idea that our kids need to be watched 24 seven and that we need to Mm -hmm. hover over them. And I, you know, it is so foreign to me as a person who grew up in the seventies. So I grew up in the 1970s. I was a kid in the seventies. I grew up in Toronto Mm -hmm. and uh, you know, part of my starting this podcast, as some people may know, is because I grew up in the seventies and I've, I have four kids. My oldest is, is in their thirties. My youngest wow. are eight years old. They're identical twins. And then I've got a 14 year old or 13, 14 year old in the mm-hmm. middle. Um, so I've seen, I've raised kids in four different, clearly the middle child, clearly the middle <laughs> child. <laughs> so I've seen a lot of things. So, you know, things have changed so drastically from the seventies when I was a kid and then eighties, nineties, two thousands and 2010s when I raised my other kids. And so I mm-hmm. thought just the whole lens of parenting, how it's changed over the years is so fascinating to me. And I guess I, you know, part of my desire in starting this podcast was I I really find myself hearkening back to those days where kids could just be carefree. Kids could just be kids and they could do what I did. So ironically, I don't even let my kids do a lot of the things that I used to do. So the whole summer in the 70s, I remember 1975, I was what nine, I don't know. I was riding around my bike at a local park, you know, most of the day. And, you know, I was right. No, I know. At nine years old, I was taking my bike and going to there was a local pool. Um, in the town I grew up in, I grew up in the suburbs of Chicago. Yeah. And, 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 you know, God, this is so long ago that the pool not only had a diving board, it had a high dive. <laughs> oh, I used to go off the high dive when I was eight and nine too, <laughs> you know? Right, right, right. And, and, uh, yeah, the, this, this, this uh, era disappeared and suddenly, and I think about this all the time and I guess so do you too. Uh, children were were like almost prisoners, right? They yeah. they are watched twenty four seven. They are transported where they have to be, which is often school or a sport that is going to also be supervised by an adult. And then they're tra- you know they're put in the transport vehicle, which happens to be you know the SUV, right? And taken back where they will perform their uh, you know their job, which is homework. And then they will get up and and be marched off to do it again the next day. And you're right, the freedom has completely not completely evaporated, but darn close. Well, it's evaporated to a large degree. I mean, you know, I I was saying that I I would basically spend my summer, my parents were both working outside the home, you know, we were Mm -hmm. middle class, my parents had to work. And Mm -hmm. I was, you know, I was old enough that they felt that I was responsible enough. I was a pretty good kid, you know, I, and the Mm -hmm. thing is, ironically, I tell my kids this, there was no Google, there were no cell phones. I used to have to phone my mother from a landline from a, a black rotary phone that was attached to the wall. And I'd have to <laughs> phone her at nine o'clock and say, okay, mom, I'm going to the park now. And then I'd go to the park and then I'd have to come back at 1230 and say, okay, mom, I'm at, I, you know, I'd let myself in with my key. I was a latchkey kid. And I'd say, okay, mom, I'm, I'm home now. And I'm going to make my lunch. And I used to fry bacon and all kinds of stuff wow. <laughs> right you know, by myself. And you're alive today. I'm alive. I lived. I'd have to tell my mother, Yes, mom, I turned off the stove. And then I'd say, okay, mom, I'm now leaving and I'm going to my friend Diane's house and I'll call you in a few hours. And that was totally fine. And now when you tell parents or you tell, you know, people on the street that this is what you did, they look at you in horror and shock. And my parents were great parents. They loved me and my brothers dearly. They provided for us. They were responsible. But I think the key was that they trusted us. And you can see where I'm going with this, because I think this is a great segue for you, Lenore, because it's not about me, this podcast, you to tell us your story, because I think your story is so fascinating about your son. So set the stage for us and let us know how did all for the people who are not aware of your background in your story. How did it start? Okay. Um, I will tell you that I now have a husband padding around behind me. So I will tell him, Joe, I'm on a podcast. (laughs) There. Um, So it started back uh, when uh, we have two sons. And when our younger son was nine, he started asking me and my husband if we would take him someplace he hadn't been before here in New York City, where we live, and let him find his own way home on the subway. That was his dearest dream. Yeah. And we talked about it, the husband who's patting around behind me and I, and we decided, sure, you know, we're, we're on the subways all the time. They're, yes, they're crowded. We think there's safety in numbers. It doesn't make it more, more, more dangerous. It makes it less dangerous, and it's, I don't think it's dangerous at all. So we decided, yes, and one sunny Sunday, I took him to Bloomingdale's, a fancy department store in a fancy neighborhood yeah. um, where I don't normally shop. <laughs> and uh, I left him there, and he took the subway home. And when he came through the door of our apartment, he was levitating because <laughs> he had done something that he knew he was ready for and that his parents believed he was ready for. And so it was just a great experience. 
and I, I'm a newspaper columnist by trade. Well, well a trade that's evaporating, but I was. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and I didn't write about it right away because it didn't strike me as that big a deal. Um, but when some of the other fourth grade parents I was talking to were saying, uh, yeah, you know, they were going to let their kids do that when they were a little older, like, you know, <laughs> like 38, <laughs> 39. Um, I, I asked my editor, should I write about, is he taking the subway by himself? And she said, yeah, you know, sounds like a nice local story. And after that nice local story ran, um, two days after that, I was on the Today Show, MSNBC, Fox News, and NPR. Oh, my goodness. For doing something so outrageous. and. The outrageous thing, you know, the, the the cherry on the top is that it was the New York subway. Right. But the reality of why people were, um, you know, shocked at all was that I had let a nine-year-old out of my sight to do something on his own. Holy smokes. Now, what year was this? In 2008? That was 2008. Yeah, I'm trying to think. Yeah, Yeah, 2008. 2008. Now, I recall the headlines from that time. By the way, I was cheering you in the sidelines. Hey, hey, I (laughs) heard you. (laughs) But I heard, (laughs) well, because I used to ride the subway, too, when I was 9 and 10 in Toronto. I mean, it's not New York City, but, you know, it's, again... (laughs) <laughs> there's so much to unpack here. So um, so the, the verbiage that I was reading at the time was world's worst mom, wor- world's mm-hmm. worst parent, blah, blah, blah. And that mm-hmm. was that was kind of the, the, the angle that the media took in vilifying you as a mm-hmm. parent making that decision that I strongly believe that parents need to make for their own children because we know our mm-hmm. children best, what they can handle. Uh, how was that in terms of, was, were you surprised at the reaction that you got were you <laughs> shocked were you upset you, you have a podcast don't you wish that every podcast went viral and people couldn't <laughs> stop talking about it for 10 years yes you know? and yet most of them don't right uh that's the way with me I mean I, I write columns all the time and uh and one of them excited people and a, a couple of years ago, I was looking through old columns of mine trying to put together a little book. And um, so I'm reading all these things that I've totally forgotten about. And I see that when my kids were, you know, three and five, I was writing columns that said there, there were two boys. So it's like, yes, we went to the children's theater and I sent them into the men's room alone. You know, I didn't think that anything terrible would happen. You want to want to sue me, sue me. And then. You know, they're five and seven. Oh, I sent them down to the courtyard in our building, which has absolutely no cars and a lot of guards because it was a giant apartment complex. You know, and that seemed okay. They All they have to do is go vertically. They just have yeah. to go down the elevator, 18 floors, and there they are at the courtyard saying hello. You know, they say goodbye to the doorman who can see them out the window, and then they play. So that didn't strike me as a crazy thing either. But other parents were afraid to let their kids literally ride down this elevator in a middle-class apartment complex and go and play where they could, you know, you could look out the window and see them. And there really were a lot of security guards. So there was something that was puzzling to me all along that I hadn't put my finger on, which is this idea that the second they are out of your sight, um, they are in grave danger, which is, that's the, that's the thing that gets me up in the morning. And it it sounds like it might get you up in the morning. How did we get to the point where we literally don't trust our kids without an adult supervising them 24-7. And I, uh, it's, it's such a new and bizarre way of having to raise our kids that gives them no freedom, but also gives us no freedom. Well, that's the thing. It's a logistical you know, nightmare. 24-7, you're, you know, you're saying like your mom, you know, your dad and your mom worked and off they went and you came home to an empty house because that's how it, that's, that's what made the whole family function. Exactly. Right? They had two incomes and you were expected to take care of yourself. And nowadays... I, actually, you're talking to me from Canada. There was this crazy decision in British Columbia at the Supreme Court level there that decided uh, there was a divorce. Do you know this whole story about this, the divorced mom with the eight-year-old kid? Um, I don't know if that – I think – are you talking about the, the the man who put his kids on the – street? No, the, the man – no, that, that came That later, was ridiculous so. too. <laughs> right, right. It was. Um, British Columbia, something wrong. Um, but but uh, I'll tell you, the president, and then that that led to the man with the uh, with the bus kids. But so this mom divorced, uh, let her let her son come home at age eight, and the husband, either because he really believed that this endangered the child, or because he wanted to get back his ex, called up child protective services, and they sent around you know a young uh, child you know social worker. Yeah. Who said, oh, my God, I, I, when I have kids, I'm not going to let them come home. Anything could happen. They could be kidnapped. They could be eaten. And um, 
And the mother said, no, I really think my kid is safe. I'm, you know, he's not cooking when he's home. He's not doing anything. He comes home, he has a snack, he does his homework. No, no, no. Um, that's, that's endangering your child because of this mindset that anytime a kid is unsupervised, they're automatically in danger. So yeah. it ended up in front of a judge at the Supreme Court level. And he listened to the social worker and he listened to the mom. He said, well, of course, I have to listen to the social worker. She's an expert. And if she doesn't think it's safe because she's right, anything could happen. Um, it isn't. And so that became the precedent that you have to be uh, 10 years old uh, before you can be home alone. And then this recent case out of uh, British Columbia as well, Vancouver, where a dad trained his four children ages 11, 9, 8, and 7, I think, to, to take the local bus, which, you know, <laughs> the idea is, is there anything safer than, first of all, yes. Canada? Right? No, there isn't. <laughs> Public transportation with four children on it going from in front of their house to in front of their school, dropped off from one place to the other, yes. the four of them watching out for each other, the bus driver, and the people, you know, most people love and care for children. Of course right? they, they don't do. Children, they're not going to hurt them, mm -hmm. right? And, and, uh, and yet... When somebody called in and said, there's these four children who are behaving very well and getting themselves to and from school, uh, out came the social worker who, and, and they, they thought, gee, this is a great dad. These are wonderful kids. Let's look up any reason not to think that this is fine. And of course they found one because bureaucracies will always come up with a reason to exist. Yes. And their reason is to second guess parenting choices. And so they, they found that Supreme Court decision that said nobody under 10 can be outside alone. I mean, could be inside alone. They turned it to outside alone. And an 11-year-old can't take care of the younger kids. So suddenly these four children who had been happily, successfully, and safely getting themselves to and from school were not only grounded from, from the bus, but now they're not even allowed to be home alone. And they can't do anything alone without the dad. And so you've yoked the dad to them. Yes. And you've... You've stymied their development because now they are babies. This is absolutely, to me, this is this is an upside down world we're living in in many yeah. ways. Uh, this is just a small part of it. But, you know, you've made a really key point there, Lenore, about yoking the dad. Because let's face it, logistics alone in terms of coordinating <laughs> kids right now, I've, I've, I've banished my children from my room where I'm doing this interview. I've told my husband, keep them downstairs because I don't want them running in. Um, and, you know, that alone, today we're, we're ferrying them around to different lessons. And tomorrow my daughter has volleyball. And it's it's just, uh, you know, just... It's a weekend. It's yeah, a weekend. Yeah, yeah. So when you have young kids, it's only been recently that my 13, she's almost 14, she's now watching the boys, the, the eight-year-olds. But again, you know, even the fact that she's watching the two eight-year-olds when we're not here, that's my that's my uh, taking in of the culture of helicopter parenting and fear because why is it that I have my 14-year-old watching the two eight-year-olds right. when I was eight-year-old eight years old riding my bike alone all summer in the, in the park. Do, so, do you remember the case he, uh, here down here in the States? Um, There's this woman, Deborah Harrell, and she's a single mom, and her daughter was nine. Mm -hmm. And she worked at McDonald's, and every day the daughter would come with her to McDonald's with her laptop and just play the laptop yes. for eight hours while the mom worked her shift. Mm -hmm. Then they, there was a burglary, and the laptop was stolen. And mm -hmm. so now the girl had nothing to do all day, all summer long, when her mom was working. And she said, Mom, could you just drop me off? at the sprinkler park and it's a sprinkler park that was so popular there was a there was a breakfast program and a lunch program and tons of people working in the park um you know administering these programs as well as some other moms and presumably some dads and so um the mom said okay that sounds good and you know considered it and it's better than mcdonald's and there's a lot of kids around and parents so i'm sure it's safe and so the kid was playing there day one, day two, day three. Day three, a lady came up and said, I've seen you here for three days. Where is your mother? Right? Oh, because my goodness. Because everybody should have a mother surgically attached to them. And <laughs> the girl said, she's at McDonald's. That's where she's working. It's like a mile or two away. And the woman said, oh, my God, and called 911. And the, the thing that was most, well, there was a lot of sickening points to this story. But uh, so the, the, the police came. They found out where the mom was. They went and grabbed the mom. They threw her into jail. What? She spent the night in jail. And then they separated her from her child for what turned out to be 17 days. Because what kind of crazy, awful, negligent harpy lets her child play outside in the summer at a sprinkler park? And I'm thinking, um... My mom, the crazy my <laughs> mom too. Harpy who lived for her children and was a stay-at-home mom, did the same thing. But what was interesting to me was not just this assumption that, of course, the child was um, was in danger because she was unsupervised. What, what also interested me is that 
the uh, the liberal press here in the states was saying that's why we need more money for daycare. There were two sides, um, all all in favor of the mom. One was, you know, give the mom some. I guess everybody believed that the mom should be trusted to love her her daughter and know what's best for her daughter. But there was this other side pushing for if only there was daycare in the summer, we wouldn't have a problem like this. And I thought, you don't need daycare. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. What you need is to allow kids to have their own fun. Daycare assumes that they still need adult supervision at age nine, and anything less than that is too dangerous or perhaps not even developmental enough. I mean, what if they're just playing? Shouldn't they be getting, you know, some lessons along with it or some organized games so that they can have a real summer? And to me, a real summer is riding your bike and hanging out at the at the sprinkler park. Well, totally. And you know, what I find ironic about that whole situation, Lenore, is the fact that do they really think that taking a child away from their mother for 17 yeah, days by the way. and having the child... Having the mother in jail is not more traumatic than letting this poor child enjoy themselves at the sprinkler park down the way from where mom right. works. I mean, the whole, yes. it, the, the logic or lack thereof of these types of decisions based on this culture of fear. And that's something I kind of really wanted to get your opinion on. I, I think I know what it is, but where do you think this culture of fear started? When did it start? Because obviously it's changed from the 1970s when I was a kid and you were a kid to, to now where everybody's afraid of everything. Where and what were the cultural benchmarks that facilitated this general overwhelming fear? Um, okay, I'll, I will. I will whip us through what I think are the four or five reasons, and then when we're done, remind me that I wanted to talk about um, why are we arresting parents when they're not really putting their children in danger? Yes, <laughs> right. Because yes. that was obviously the child was not in danger. But if you watch the TV episode, the 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 news that night of her arrest, it's like mom abandons child in park. And it's abandons. Like, wow. You let your kid play. Is that <laughs> abandonment now? Okay. And then the, uh, the videotape of her interrogation by the police, uh, somehow got out. I don't know how. And that, that was horrifying. I mean, if you want to feel rage against the system, it was, um, I can't remember if it was one or two cops, but this, this mother saying, I, I thought she'd be fine. Oh, you thought she'd be fine, did you? Because you don't really care. You know, anything could happen. And this anything could happen phrase is impossible to parry. Yes. Because it's true. I'm sitting here and, there, you know, I'm at the window. There, uh, An eagle could fly through accidentally yes. not seeing the pane in the glass and lay an egg on my head. And, and uh, you know, and uh, my Theoretically, phone anything can happen at any time anywhere. <laughs> I mean, right. really. Right, but that is used so often. I mean, even there was a mom arrested in New Jersey for letting her kid wait in the car for five minutes, and the and the judges in in that case, because it went to an appeals court, said uh, we don't even have to list the horrible things that could happen. And it's like that's right, because you're so lazy you can't even imagine them. You just know that they're out there. <laughs> but it, it, you're you're you can't you can't defend yourself against unreality because unreality is not real. You know, if yes. somebody wants to fantasize that something horrible could happen. You're stuck. But anyways, how did we get to this point? I'll, I'll whip us through the reasons. One is that we live in, um, you know, a media-saturated society. That, that there's 24-7 cable and, and and not to mention the Internet, which I understand is also 24-7. Yeah. Uh, and I don't know if you've seen these things lately. My God, they're popping up everywhere. I, I keep an archive of them. Of uh, Moms who write these breathless Facebook posts that say, oh, I, I, I didn't think it would happen to me. Really, I'd read some of these things, but I never thought it would happen here. And now, what has happened to them? I was at Ikea slash Target slash the grocery slash the mall with my young children that I was clinging to and were clinging to me. And we were just shopping for the things that we needed for our wonderful family. When I looked up and I noticed two foreign looking men staring at oh, my children no. as if they were merchandise. Please and stop. And then I went in the next aisle and there they were again. Readers. I have no doubt in my mind that they were there to sex traffic my kids. Oh, well, no. I stared back at them. I stared long and hard. And I thank God I didn't do anything like glance down at my phone or reach out and look at the ingredients on the cake box because then my children would be gone. Don't let this happen to you. Oh, and no. People share this like it is the most helpful, horrific story that everybody must know about because it's happening everywhere. And it's like, it, I'm like, it is happening everywhere. Everywhere you go in a store, there will be some other people. <laughs> it's happening everywhere. But if you'll notice, 
nothing happened. Literally nothing happened. The, 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 the guys, and oh, they only had a few items in their cart so that they could easily get away. It's like, yeah, because if you're kidnapping a child and you have a lot of items in your cart, you feel compelled to stay. And right. I mean, there's, there's zero logic. It's only hysteria. And, and some of these get, get shared tens of thousands of times. Some of them get shared hundreds of thousands of times because people love to be scared. And there's really, there's no anchoring their fears to reality. So one of the reasons that they're not anchored is because the worst stories are the ones that get on TV yes. and, and, and that's the news. And then they get recycled and they're in law and order and then CSI and whatever else is on the criminal minds. And you're surrounded by these stories and your brain takes them in and you know, you, you rationally understand that some of them are fiction and, and some of them are not. And that the news takes the worst stories and they don't ever tell you about the kids who got to school safely. Only ones who didn't. Right. Um, but that doesn't help because your brain is, is, wired to be on alert for anything that could hurt your child and in the olden days before television or or the media anything that could hurt your child was something that was immediate it was a lion in the neighborhood it was uh you know poison sumac and you got to the point where if you saw poison sumac you knew don't let your kid eat it but now we have these stories swirling around from around the globe and from hollywood's minds and they're they're in there and when you think Gee, I wonder if my kid can walk safely to the bus stop. Up comes J.C. Dugard taken to the bus stop. Up comes eight ton pads taken from the bus stop. Up comes that Law and Order episode where the kid was taken from the bus stop, and and so those are the you know the first five or ten responses that are, are you know things that you find when you ask your brain, and we think that those are the most relevant to our search because those are the top results. And, and if you were searching for a vacation to, you know, Mexico, you would say, oh, these are the, you know, people like these, these vacation packages and, and you wouldn't really dig much further. And now those, uh, those search results are all terrifying. And my mom and probably your mom, if you're growing up in seventies, couldn't name 10 kids who had been stolen, um, over the years. Yes. Canada has two a year about that. Um, sometimes zero. Uh, but but today's moms can they can they can list them and and because they are so top of mind they start their their stories seem extremely relevant if it happened to them it could happen to me some one lady once wrote to me I don't care if the odds are one in a billion that's not a chance I want to take and I'm like if you don't want to take a one in a billion chance you better just sleep on a mat on the floor because you could die falling out of bed exactly there's the shower that. You, you better know, not get in the car and drive anywhere because car accidents are, are you know, pretty common. They're less right. than one in a billion. That's, you know, <laughs> I mean, yeah, come on. There's nothing left. Yeah, can't, can't chew food. So, all right. So the media is out there driving us crazy and um, it and our brains are wired to um, to pick up fear, right? And yeah. To, to replay it uh, almost on an endless loop. Uh, we live in a litigious society. And mm-hmm. when you live in a society where people are suing all the time, or when you worry that they're suing all the time, you start thinking like, wow, you know, this coffee is so hot. I could sue, you know, people think that that's, that's yes. how it happens. Or wow. If my kid, you know, my kid's going over to your house. If she falls off the swing, you know, you better, I hope you have good homeowner's insurance because that's going to be your fault because nothing should ever happen. Nobody should ever have an accident. In England, I heard they're trying to ban the word accident because really? there's nothing the insurance company would love better than uh, than thinking that there's always someone to blame so they don't have to pay out. So it's this idea that there's everything is out to get you. Everything is dangerous. You look at anything. I'm looking at stuff on my desk. I see a I guess a, a pen cap that could occlude the airways if a child oh, mouthed it. And uh, I don't know, my cell phone, if it gave me wrong. If I, I, it just anything could be cut. There's paper galore. Think of all the paper cuts and what if they get infected and then there's gang green. So basically, when you live in a litigious <laughs> society, you start thinking about everything um, the way a lawyer would. And you can implicate anything as a danger. That's very interesting. I mean, I you know, what I'm hearing you say, Lenore, is it sounds mm-hmm. like, you know, all things considered, the rise of this culture of fear is was facilitated by our internet age and the 24-7 news cycle. Is that basically what you're saying? No, that's the beginning. The access that's to information, too? The cycle and, and internet and all the fear that comes out of the media is one. But the litigious society is something else. Um, really, we've grown up. I, I have a feeling it's worse here in the States because yeah, I if think something so. bad happens to your kid physically, we don't, you know, the insurance is not, uh, there's no national health care. And so you could end right. up if a kid breaks an arm just falling from a, 
a swing, it could end up being a ten thousand dollar proposition by the time you know you get the yes. doctor and the X rays and the cast, and maybe there's a you know something has to be done. Okay, we're going to take a quick break right now for a word from our sponsor, and we will return to our very interesting discussion with Lenore Skenazy. Stay tuned. Okay, we're back speaking with Lenore Skenazy, who was once called the world's worst mom. But um, there's two or three other reasons that I was going to just whip us through that that have, I think, contributed to this culture of fear that we're talking about. Um Three is the expert culture. Experts are telling you that you're doing something wrong. Otherwise, they have no job. And so they start out with the baby when you're when you're pregnant and they tell you, oh, you have to eat this and you can't eat that. And, oh, my God, you had a piece of softened brie or you didn't, um, yeah. you know, nuke your salami sandwich for five minutes to the point where it's a rock. And that's terrible because what about this or that? And so they come up – What it's sort of like the lawyers. They come up with these very um, – far-fetched dangers and they warn you about them because one unquote once again anything could happen and so you start out thinking of yourself not as a normal person carrying a normal child but as a um a vessel carrying something that you could ruin at right. any moment by doing the wrong thing by you know by eating the wrong food by having a glass of wine whatever it is it's just everything is writ large there's no difference between a tiny percentage chance that something might go wrong and, you know, near certainty that something will go wrong. And the way the warnings are phrased, they make us terrified from the get-go, which is that, you know, do you want to ruin your child's life with that bologna sandwich? Is it worth it? And it's yeah. like, ah, oh, I guess not, you know? So so we're, we're starting, like, from the get-go, we're told that our children are in peril and only by being absolutely perfect and constantly vigilant can we um, maybe uh, be allowed to have a kid without severe problems? So it's it starts the culture of alarmism or whatever you want to call it. Right. Um, the minute you're pregnant, sometimes before, I mean, like the, the what to expect when you're expect, expecting books now have pages and pages about what to do before you what? get pregnant. So it just keeps working its way backwards. To what are you supposed to do? I, I didn't know this. I haven't looked at one of those books for years. So what what are some of the proposed things you're oh, supposed God. to do? Oh, God. I used to have, I mean, if you want, I can actually look up my list here because I, I wrote a <laughs> list um, when I when I boiled it down. Hang on. Okay. Here, this is, uh, this is their 10 pages boiled down to one paragraph. Okay. So okay. Uh, before you even have a baby, you should Lose weight, get shots, research your family history, talk to a genetic counselor, take vitamins, cut back on caffeine, check your meds, rev up the romance, fix your teeth, which what? will help in the romance department, uh, <laughs> find a doctor, get a checkup, avoid hot tubs, get rid of the electric blanket, quote unquote, get to know your cervix, which I'm always like, um, uh, no, <laughs> hi, uh, you know, I've, I've ba- barely paid attention to you for 30 years, but um, let's, let's get to know each other now. What, what's your name? <laughs> get to know your cervix. I still don't know my cervix. Um, cut down on alcohol. Alcohol, eat more vegetables, avoid environmental hazards, consider changing jobs, re- reevaluate your budget, draw up a will, and above all, relax. No, no uh, wait a minute. I have to step. Wait, wait. Is this is this an onion article or is this real? <laughs> is this real? Well, when they when they take ten pages to write it, it sounds very sincere and caring, and it's just for you know, it's just best practices, which is also another um, horrible thing that we've been told. Best practices are like. Nobody needs to do best practices. You just have to do okay practices. Nobody has to do best practices in oh every <sighs> endeavor that involves your kids, but these are them, you know. So you're so basically anyway, setting that's, people that's up just, for failure. Well, it's just setting you up to feel neurotic. Um, uh, it, it sets you up for two things. One is to be um, terrified that if you're not vigilant, something terrible will happen and it's your fault. And B, if something terrible does happen, you must assume it is your fault. And yeah. so what I really hate about the what to expect books is they say that if you do everything absolutely right, including every bite of every day for nine months is maximum kale, right? Oh, <laughs> Maybe man. a little quinoa thrown in if you're really good. Um, then you have good chance of having a child with, you know, decent birth weight, brain development, you know, uh, fewer birth defects. But if you veered off and ate that Kit Kat um, and your child is born with some problems, it's you. It's it's you because you couldn't. You didn't have the will of steel to resist that Kit Kat wow. or that glass of wine, and it's all your fault. And so it's it's this blame thing that is out there that is making us very very scared. Because in you know you're you're talking about parenting then and now. I mean you know that 
a hundred years ago, certainly two hundred years ago, you could expect many of your children not to make it. I mean, there's, yeah. there's all sorts of ceremonies and all sorts of cultures. I met a lady who, who does kimonos and. She does kimonos for the three-year-old ceremony, the five-year-old ceremony, and the seven-year-old ceremony. I'm like, what are those? Wow. And like you celebrated if your kid made it to three. That was fantastic. And if your kid made it to five, oh, my God, mazel tov. And seven, wow. you know, let's get the greatest kimono on earth because it was so rare for the children to make it that long. Mm -hmm. And so when you're in that kind of culture, first of all, it's, it's sad and traumatizing. But you don't blame the parents that their kids didn't make it because – nobody's kids made it right it was it was you just knew that part of having children was the fact that some terrible things would happen along the way and nowadays we don't have that that knowledge i mean because we're so lucky to be living in a time when most kids do make it to adulthood yeah the fact that some of them might not is not because you know that's just the way it is like in the olden days or japan or whatever it's it's because you did something wrong maybe you ate a kit kat when you were pregnant Maybe you didn't walk to the park and stay there all day while your child frolicked in the sprinklers. Maybe you let them wait in the car for three minutes uh, while you went into the grocery. Um, everything is uh, every instance of uh, non constant surveillance is considered negligent to the point of almost you know, willing your child to die. And even if your child lives, because they will live if they wait three, three, three minutes in a car and they will live if they go to the park. But the fear that something bad could happen and there will be no communal sympathy, only finger pointing and, and, and Facebook commenting, see, that's why she should never have, oh my God, I would never do that. Well, she got what she deserved. That'll teach her a lesson. It's like, really? There's no sympathy for when anything goes wrong because there's the assumption that we can control everything and we should be doing that. And if you're not yeah. doing that, you're not a good enough problem. And we don't care if something terrible happens to your kid because we will use you as um, a whipping boy. Oh my goodness. So one of the... Um, stories that comes up sometimes in the winter is don't put your child in a car seat in their coat, right? Mm -hmm. And so I found the guy who issued this edict. He's a, mm -hmm. a doctor out in, I can't remember, Seattle or Portland or something. And I called him up and we had a long conversation and he explained that the compression, there's space, if you're if you're wearing a coat, there's there's a little bit of air space between the, uh, the, the, the seat belt equivalent in a car seat and the child's flesh. Right. Because right. it's not just flush up against them. There's this little cushion of air. And if you're in a giant impact, you know, going 70 miles an hour and this or that and you're thrown backwards and, you know, you start you start picturing this thing. Oh, my God. Oh, the poor child. Oh, my God. A crash. Blah, blah, blah. You know, there's there's more square, you know, PSI, whatever the pounds yeah. per square inch force than if they hadn't been wearing a coat. And and I said, OK, I get it. But, you know, you have. You have the twins, right? And oh, it's Toronto, and it's freezing cold, and you have to put them in their their uh, you know their 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 down jackets to go outside because you're walking all the way across the the parking lot to get to the mall or the school or whatever. But then you have to take off their what is the word for a, a winter thing? They snowsuit. It's not just a snowsuit. Snow suit. That's yeah. it. Okay, so you're putting them in their snowsuit to go across the, the snowy parking lot or wherever it is, but then you get them back to the car, and then you have to take off that whole giant snowsuit while one of them is waiting and freezing no. outside, and one of them is getting in the car. That's and not happening. And then you drive home because you've gotten, now you've gotten your gallon of milk, or whatever you guys say up there. Your, liters. Your, uh, liters. Liters of milk. <laughs> we have bags of milk, too, but that's another, okay. another show. Okay. <laughs> right. The point being that um, it's, it's asking too much of the parents for... Uh, probably you're not going to be in a car accident. And if, God forbid, you are in a car accident, probably the kid wearing a coat is not the difference between life and death. I mean, he didn't even have any statistics which showed that it was the difference between life and death. And he said, well, it's just best practices. And I'm like, By best whom? practices and reality aren't always on the same page. And to me, it seems more important. You're putting the kid in the car seat and... You know, so they're wearing a coat. Is that the end of the world? But it's written as if it's the end of the world. And every year in the winter, there are news stories that come out. Child, you know, coat, you know, coat danger, exclamation point, is your child next, question mark. And and so you get to the point where everything is um, just so exacting and unforgiving 
that you as a parent must do, um, not necessarily to keep your kids safe, but to uh, almost have performed the superstitious rituals that prove that you care. Yeah. So it, it becomes somewhere between reality and, I don't know, a prayer or a ritual uh, to do all these things exactly right. And it's a little OCD as well. Yeah, it absolutely is. And, you know, I, I want to get back just for a minute to the whole situation that occurred with your son, because as you said, you, you, you put your son on the subway, he did a great job, he was thrilled, everybody was happy, you thought it was kind of a non-deal, really, until you got all this blowback. Within a day, you're on the Today Show, you're on all over the media with a negative narrative. So what I really love, Lenore, is the yeah. fact that you turned around the narrative about what the media and the general public were saying for you. I know that originally, initially, you must have been horrified in terms of how they were vilifying you in the media and using this this title of world's worst mom, et cetera, et cetera. But you kind of took that and turned it on its turn it turned it on its head and turned the narrative around and put it back to everyone else to say, wait a minute, everybody, why is it that we have this perception that our kids are uh, in danger at all times? So can you tell me a little bit about how you went through that shift, how you got there? Because I'm sure at first it was probably mortifying for you. It was so perplexing, you know, after I was on all those TV shows, my husband understands tech to the point where, this is 10 years ago, where he could start a blog for me. So, you know, he set up a blog for me and I called it Free Range Kids. And I started it that weekend um, after I'd been on the TV shows to say that I love safety. I just don't think the kids need a security detail every time they leave the house. And ever since then, what has what has really changed my life is the comments. <laughs> yeah. You know, they always say, don't read the comments. But, but people have enlightened me so much about, A, what's going on around the country in terms of excessive safety and unfair rules and sometimes laws and um, the forces that are arrayed against parents who trust their kids and trust their communities and how they're not allowed to do that. And so what changed is really the blog. The blog really informed me about the state of, like I live in Manhattan, well now I live in Queens, but I lived in Manhattan at the time and I didn't know that around the country parents were driving their kids to the bus stop car until the bus came and then witnessing the transfer. And and here in, here in New York, I was with my friend yesterday who was dropping off her kid who was waiting at the bus stop, um, an urban bus stop right near me. And uh, her kid got on and nobody left the bus stop, even though the kids were on the bus until the bus had safely pulled away and one mom was jumping up and down waving and I don't I don't blame parents for going with this the social norm but it seemed odd to me that all the children had parents with them at the bus stop that the parents didn't even trust their own eyes to see that they were okay already on the bus they had to see the bus leave and they they acted as if this was a great departure, like the children were going away to summer camp or to a refugee camp. Yeah. You know, there was almost tears. And I I love loving my kids. And I walked my kids to school before I started realizing like, that's odd. Why do we all walk our kids to school? I walk to school by myself. Um, there's something that is very heightened. And everybody is feeling it as a parent. And so to not feel it um, is makes you an oddball, but I wanted to, I wanted to figure out why then and now, then and now my mom was a stay at home mom and like, yeah. and she stayed at home. Imagine that while I uh, went to school and then came home. And it's, it almost reminds me sometimes of the peekaboo game you play with kids. It's like, they can't believe that like they close their eyes and they open them and there you are again, because they haven't understood the persistence idea that things don't disappear just because their eyes are closed. Right. And I feel like We've gotten to that point with our kids. We don't believe they're safe unless we are watching them. And and so we do. We watch them as much as we can. And if we can't watch them physically, we watch them with an app. And if we're not somehow in touch with them, if they don't text when they got there and text when they're leaving and give a call and watch them on the where's my iPhone because they have an iPhone and I can watch them, yeah. we don't think that they're you know, it's almost like we say we don't think they're safe. It's almost like they don't exist. And our job is, uh, you know, we, we violated something fundamental, which is constant surveillance. Yeah. And that's, that's, 
like we st- said at the beginning, that's asking, you know, that's asking kids to be treated as prisoners. And then we have to be the, the guards. That's an interesting analogy. What do you think, Lenore, this whole culture of fear and helicopter parenting has done to children's feelings of mm-hmm. self-assuredness and independence? Because at the end of the day, isn't that what we're supposed to do as parents is to teach our kids to be independent, to teach our kids to have self-assuredness and to trust their judgment? What do you think it's done to our kids? Well, it's such an interesting phrase. You just said teach our kids independence because... You can't teach independence. Okay. <laughs> independence comes from being independent. And so what we have to be able to do is give them some independence so that they learn that and they learn the resourcefulness. They learn the um, resilience in the face of getting lost or having an argument or not getting their way. And if we're always with them, they're not learning those things. So it's. I'm glad you asked about this because I'm just starting, like literally as of two days ago, signed the papers to incorporate a, um, a new nonprofit called let grow. Oh, and yeah, it's, and let grow started. It's, it's me and a guy named, um, Jonathan Haidt, who wrote a a very influential essay a few years ago called the coddling of the American mind. How come so many kids are arriving on campus seemingly so fragile that they need safe spaces and trigger warnings and all these things because they're worried about their psychological, um, resilience really. Yeah. And um, a guy named Peter Gray, who I love, I highly recommend his book called Free to Learn, Okay. Um, who writes about the way kids really learn is when they're curious and when they're playing, they they get all the lessons that we wish they would get, you know, to, to survive. Like um, they learn how to organize themselves. They learn to hold themselves together if they, you know, if they uh, get an out, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, they learn to, in mixed age play, you have... The 12 year old learns to throw the ball a little softer to the six year old and the six year old who wanted to have a tantrum because, you know, we, I wanted to play, be the dog and you made me the cat holds it together because he doesn't want to look like a baby in front of the really cool 12 year old. And so you have, um, you know, creativity and compromise and communication and um, problem solving all wrapped up in something called free play. And we've taken that out of our kids lives. And replaced it with supervised activities because we feel that that's safe, whereas playing in the park is not. So the three of us, plus Dan Shuckman, who is the chairman of a group called FIRE here in New York, in in the States, which uh, fights for free speech on campus. Yeah. Not a right-wing organization, a completely nonpartisan organization that believes in this crazy idea that people can exchange ideas and that's not violence. Mm -hmm. Um, In fact, that's the Enlightenment. So the, the, the people more concerned with kids on campus came to me and said, there's something happening that they arrive there, you know, fragile and falling apart. Peter Gray was a professor at Boston College where kids were going to the counseling center because they had an argument with their roommate or they, there was a mouse in their apartment and, and not knowing how to deal with, you know, negative feelings or something new and a little bit difficult and upsetting. And so the the assumption that we're working on is that by doing everything with and for our kids, the kids don't get to develop those skills because we're there. We do them better. We'll make the teams. We'll make the snack. Yeah. You know, we'll pick you up. You know, we'll make sure you don't get lost. And so they don't have any of those experiences. Obviously, they have some of those experiences. Nobody lives in a complete bubble. But they have a lot less of the everyday give and take that childhood used to be um, – you know, it used to be a big part of childhood. And when they get to college and suddenly they can choose what they want to do and, and how to do it, they demand, no, 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 tell me what to do. I want the the college dean to tell me what costume I can wear, you know, and yeah. I don't want to hear somebody on campus who upsets me because nobody has ever had the right to upset me. There's always been somebody intervening and saying, there, there, I understand. That's upsetting. Let's end it. And so the... The let grows the whole purpose for being is to make sure that kids get enough of the almost old fashioned experiences of time on their own, um, time with friends, exploring, uh, just unstructured, unsupervised time and reading and thinking so that when they get to college, they're, they're just, they have some resources when things upset them and they have new experiences. So that's that's our goal, and and one of the one of the projects that we're working on, we're working on a bunch, but the one that's easiest to sort of encapsulate is called the Let Grow Project. Yeah, and that is simply the teachers in schools 
this is a free fun thing, right? Uh, the teachers tell the kids, go home today and ask your parents if you can do one thing that you feel you're ready to do that for one reason or another you haven't done yet. Um, you can walk the dog. You can make dinner. You can, whatever you were talking about with your eight-year-olds, they can go to the park, you know, and yeah. play. You can do just something that we would have done without a second thought. And because the school is endorsing it and because it's a one-shot deal, the parents say yes, and then the kids go and they do something, and I've seen this a couple of times already in, in, in pilot programs, they they come back and they brought the, the cranberry juice for dinner, and they walk through the door, you know, they've walked five blocks there and five blocks back, and they're eight or nine or ten years old, and yeah. the parents go, wow, wow, look at that, hey, that's so cool, and they're so elated, it doesn't make sense, it doesn't make sense because all the kid did was go and get the juice. The kid is feeling proud, like, finally, my parents trust me. You know, you, you want your parents to see that you're growing up. But it's the parents' reaction that has been so amazing to me. And and at first I thought, oh, they're just proud. And then yeah. I started thinking, no, it's it's deeper than that. It's their, um, you know, it was something like um, – like, look, they survived, you know, it's, it's almost like I didn't think they could survive because I was doing the what ifing, what if there's a predator on the way, what if they get hit by a car, whatever. And here they are, they survived. And so I'm feeling elated because they're alive. But now oh, I think it's actually very, I almost think it's deeper than that. Yeah. This is my latest, latest deep thought, which is that why are the parents so ridiculously happy about something so ridiculously small? They just saw that their child was independent. And I think it's because deep down, it's what you were talking about. Our, our job is to raise, you know, resourceful, resilient, responsible people. Why? Because someday we won't be here. Yeah. <laughs> we yeah. are going to die. And our entire job is to make sure that we continue in our children, that our children become adults. You know, we can we can go off, right? Our job is done. And when they see the kid come through the door with the cranberry juice, it's like, it's, it's, it's the way of the world. It's as momentous as it gets. It's like, okay, I can die now and I won't, and my child won't die. That's, that's basically it. I can die yeah. and my child will live. And you know and that you've done your job in facilitating their independence, right? Uh, right. Well, if they can't do anything on their own and you die, that you've left somebody helpless. Yeah. Right? And no, they absolutely. Will die too. But if you have raised a child who is competent enough to do something on their own, then you know, our job is to make ourselves obsolete, you know, as, as Julie Lithcott Hames says, we're, we're raising adults. And now you get to see that it's not just, I mean, people really think that their kids are babies. They think that they have to do everything for them until they see with their own eyes, oh, no, I don't. So it's not a baby. And if you're not leaving a baby behind, you can leave. Yeah. You know, no, I... parents are consciously thinking, okay, now I can go die tomorrow. How, how wonderful that will be. <laughs> it's yeah. just, I think it is something pretty deep because it, I never understood why parents are so relieved that they can't, they can't even describe it because the kid just went and got the juice. And, you know, that sounds to me almost, you know, if you look at it from a psychological perspective, Lenore, it almost sounds like it's more about the parents than it is the kids, right? It's all, it's more about the parents' uh, neuroses than it is about the actual danger, or is it? Well, I wouldn't use the word neuroses because you were talking about yourself, that you raised your older kid quite differently from your younger kids, and you don't understand why. So it's not like you suddenly became neurotic. Mm -hmm. It's that society has foisted this view of children onto us as um, not only young and, and darling, but completely helpless and in danger. And it is your job to never let them do anything on their own. And so yeah. that's not, I mean, like we wouldn't be talking about helicopter parents if there, if each family's household had suddenly become neurotic. It's it's a society that's, you know, the, 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 the Supreme Court in British Columbia is saying nobody under 10 can be home alone. And it's a society that's saying you let your child wait in a car for three minutes, we're going to arrest you. And it's a society that's yeah. saying your, ch your third grader is not allowed to walk home alone um, until fifth grade. And then you can sign a waiver. But I we highly you know recommend against it. I mean, there's so many warnings and strictures in place now that make it impossible to to let your kid develop even if you wanted to that let grow is dedicated to renormalizing letting your child go outside parents used to know that when they were five six or seven they could start walking to school and eight nine ten they could come home by themselves with a latch 
key and they could ride their bikes out and at 12, 13, they could start babysitting. But those milestones have been buried under yeah. regulations and fear and stories on television and the Today Show and Law and Order to the point where we need to like uncover them again. So that parents realize, oh, it's not crazy to let my seven-year-old walk to school. Oh, it's not crazy to have my eight-year-old come home alone after school, make a sandwich, and watch TV or do their homework. That's so, what I did. <laughs> so Let Grow is really trying to change the laws to make the laws say that um, our children have the right to some unsupervised time and we have the right to give it to them without getting arrested. We're trying to change parenting by having the, the free range, sorry, it's now it's the let grow project. Yeah. And then we're trying to give kids more time, more free time to, to just play, to do things that are just because they're curious or they're interested or they're fun and, and, and not because it's an academic activity or it's an enrichment activity because play is damn enriching and academic and turns on every part of the brain. And so all we're trying to do is give back these fundamental childhood rights that free the kids, free the parents, and oh, by the way, allow the children to develop. I love this idea. I love it. And so you're saying that, you know, you're definitely going to be, I guess, lobbying to some degree to get some laws changed. How else are you going to manifest this? So are you going to go into schools? Are you going to yes. have a standalone oh, yeah. brick and mortar place? Right. Okay. Um, yeah. So we want people to consider, you know, just passing these resolutions or whatever you want to call it in their towns. Like, oh, we're a let grow town. We support kids outside. We're not going to arrest the parents. We're going to, the cops are going to make sure the kids are okay. They're not going to turn around and arrest the parents. And then in the schools, we're not only trying to get the let grow project to become a regular part of school, um, but we also are trying to get after school free play because I don't know, I think at the school my kids went to after school, there were so many choices of things that the school offered. You could do robotics, you could do knitting, you could do uh, Spanish, you could do homework help, but you couldn't go to the gym with your buddies and just and, play. Uh, play ball. You know, the, the ball playing was okay. There's soccer in the fall and there's you know baseball in the in the spring, and so uh, why not make one option at all the schools across North America be free play and and you you solve so many problems at once because a you have a place for the kids to be after school that the parents feel is safe enough. B, when my kids came home, some of the times I would try to send them outside and there'd be no other kids to play with because nobody's sending their kids outside. And so they would come right back in. And I was sure that like, if you lived across the street from me, you'd say, oh, look, you know, the Skenazies aren't outside. You're, nobody's going outside and your kids would stay in. So at school, you have a, um, a critical mass of children and they're of different ages, you know, K through eight or K through five. So uh, you have enough kids to play with. You have a place that the, the parents trust. Um, you have a bunch of time, you know, a three-hour swath of time, three to six, when the kids could just play. And um, to relieve everybody's anxieties, you have an adult somewhere on the premises uh, who is not determining the games, is not deciding who won or lost, isn't inserting themselves <laughs> in the spats, is just there with an EpiPen crouching in the corner, you know, like a lifeguard if something goes terribly, terribly wrong. So we're trying to get free play to just be an after school option or sometimes even a before school option. We have seven schools um, on Long Island here in New York mm -hmm. uh, that are doing it before school starting next Friday. So I love this. Um, yeah, we'd like to be in the schools and we'd like to um, do some research that will reassure parents that free time is not wasted time. Even if it looks like wasted time, kids are developing their interests. They're developing focus once they find something that they like, whatever it is that they're doing. And, um, and that they, their kids will not fall behind. In fact, their kids will develop the, the flexibility and the creativity and the problem solving that they need to survive in a very, very weird economy that's coming at us where everybody has to be so flexible because whatever your job was three years ago, it's going to be something new, you know, tomorrow. So our job is to sort of be out there in the culture doing things like talking to you. Yeah. And in the schools, trying to get the schools to encourage, the schools are a great way to get to the parents, to encourage them to give their kids more freedom. And then to, to make people realize that they want to live in a town where they know that if they send their kids outside, it's going to be okay. Because if I had a choice of town A or town B, in town A, I can send my kids to the park. And town B, if I do that, I just might get arrested. I'm not going to choose town B. Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. It, it has to be a you know a community uh, a community initiative where everybody's on board. And I see what you're doing because you're actually going to the legislative bodies and making sure that parents are not going to get arrested if a kid mm-hmm. is seen playing in the park. And basically, you're saying let's just bring back unstructured play because back when we were kids, that's that's what you did. There wasn't. I mean, I don't know about you, but in Toronto here, there was not a lot of after school extracurricular programs available. Mm -hmm. Basically, we went to school at 3.30, you went home, Mm -hmm. or you played with your friends, or you went to your friend's house, or you went home like I did, and I let myself in and watched Gilligan's Island and the Brady Bunch, you know, like, (laughs) that's... Maybe that's the key, maybe maybe (laughs) why why we're pining for this is all our years of Gilligan's Island, you know, they were so resourceful, oh my god, The, the key phrase here is like we had, but it's not just like our childhood, it's like every childhood in the history of humanity until now, you know, kids were always in packs of mixed age people and the older kids looked after the younger kids and yes there were spats and yes there were some you know scrapes and 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 bruises but it was not written as insane unless you had an adult overlord and that's what's changed and it's not just you know a 1960s or 70s or 80s childhood versus now it's the history of humanity until about 1990. So so something has dramatically changed. And we think it's been, you know, for the safety of our precious children. But it turns out that we've taken out actually one of the biggest safeguards, which is letting them learn how to roll with some punches and problem solve. And that's what we're trying to give them back. Not something from the 70s, not something from the 60s, something from humanity. Yeah, no, such a great point, Lenore. And so I have one last question for you. And, uh, mm-hmm. you know, so for all the parents out there who are listening and who might be hesitant about letting their their kid go to the park or leaving them alone for a few hours or walking to the store, mm-hmm. what can you tell them to allay their fears and to ease their mind and to let them let their kids take those first steps towards independence and being self-reliant? Yeah, that is a great question. Well, that's why in, you know, in future years, you won't have to ask because all, all kids will be doing this automatically because it's, it's like, you know, the school is suggesting it and all the other parents are doing it and it just becomes a normal part of their lives. Every year you give the kids a couple of these let grow projects. But for right now, I'd say think back on your own childhood and what you were doing at a certain age. And if you didn't think your parent was crazy to let you do that, Assume that you're not crazy to let your own child do that because the crime rate today in your country is at a 25 or 26 year low, and and um and even our country, which is now my you know in the United States, which is at uh, the the crime rate of 1963, I don't think our crime rate was ever as low as yours. So you have the lowest crime rate like in the world. So be grateful, take advantage of it, give your kids the childhood that you wish they had, that you had. And, um, and and watch the results. I, you might be as ecstatic as as the parents who do that Let Grow project, who see their kid come through the door with the with the cranberry juice. It's what you're, when you're doing everything with your kids, you are actually taking away. I'd say the most fun and joyful part of childhood, which of, of, of parenthood, which is seeing what your kids can do without you. Uh, and I'll give you one last story, um, which is that I was talking to this. When the when the Maytee story broke, the parents who were arrested um, in Maryland for letting yes. them walk home to the park, everybody was going crazy. And so the Washington Post, particularly because it, it was um, right outside of Washington, and so I was talking to one of the columnists there, and she was saying like, I, I don't know how we got talking about this literal story, but anyway, so she was telling me that the, the weird thing that had happened to her just recently was that uh, her eight year old was supposed to stay for after school, and accidentally the carpool lady picked him up and brought him home and she wasn't home and the door was locked because that was not the plan. And so the kid got there and was like, huh, I don't have a key, can't get in the house. So he ended up walking um, about three blocks away to the local like mini grocery store. And, um, and he told them what had happened and his mom wasn't home and they started calling and calling and calling her. And the mom kept seeing this number that she didn't know showing up on her phone. So she kept ignoring it because she's a reporter. She got things to do. Um, but finally, you know, after a long time, she picked up, it's like, okay, who is this? And it's like, mom, it's me. What? (laughs) What do you mean? Where where are you? What's going on? Why are you calling me? Don't worry. I'm, I'm at the grocery, you know, that's three blocks from our house and I'm using their phone. They let me use their phone. I just want to tell you that the door was locked. Oh my God. You know, she said she raced to her car and she drove over as fast as she can. And she went through the door of the grocery and there's her son 
<laughs> putting the meat on the shelves next to this nice older Korean man who was doing it with him. It's like, here, honey, you can do this. And, and, and her heart melted. It was, it was so fantastic. Her son was so proud and so happy. And he had a snack. They'd give him a snack and he'd done his homework. And then, there was, you know, the mom still hadn't picked up the phone. So it's like, well, why don't you help out around the grocery? And so she had this elated day of realizing, wow, look at my son. He, he figured out what to do. And he came here and he's met these people. And he even has a little job. And the kid felt proud, but the mom felt prouder. And it's that thing again. It's like, look who my kid is. Look what he can do on his own. And if you're always with them and always helping them and always watching them, you don't get that joy. Oh, my goodness. What a great way of concluding this podcast. I, I have nothing else to say. I think I think that's fantastic. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lenore, for being on the show. I really appreciate it. I think this has been so enlightening. And I'm really thrilled to have been able to speak with you because, as I said, I've been a longtime supporter of what you're doing. And I love what you're trying to do now with your new program. So I'm absolutely going to share uh, all of your websites, your blog. Uh, we will put all of that information on the PTAN podcast website and uh, share it over social media as well on our Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and all of that kind of great stuff. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much for taking the time again. I really do appreciate it. And uh, Oh, you're most welcome. And I, I had fun too. And I really do love the historical perspective. I mean, it, it, it perspective is the word. It gives you back perspective. It totally does. Thanks, Lenore. Okay, thank you. Talk to you soon. Well, talk okay. to you at some point. And if you come to New York, come to me. I will come to you, and I'll take the subway by myself. <laughs> right. It's those eight-year-olds I'm aiming for. <laughs> okay, bye-bye. All right, thanks. Bye. Well, that was so much fun and enlightening, too. Lenore is so grounded and so chill about parenting and raising kids. It was really refreshing talking to her. Her perspective really makes you think about how we're raising kids and whether or not we're doing them a disservice in overparenting them. If you want to know more about Lenore and the Let Grow program, visit the PTAN podcast website and click on the show notes for this episode. So what do you think? Leave a message for me on our website at ptanpodcast.com, via Twitter at PTAN Podcast, or on our very active Facebook group. And don't forget, if you enjoy this podcast, please give it a rating on iTunes or Apple Podcasts and leave your review because I love to hear what you think about the show and leaving a review also helps others find the program as well. That's it for this week. Thanks so much for listening and we'll see you next time. Bye.